from Ireland, Roddy Doyle and Rob Doyle. I'll ask those of you who are in the Zoom here with us to just keep your cameras and mics off throughout, but feel free to write in the chat and we'll be monitoring the chat and uh, hopefully we can get to read out your comments and questions. Um, if you have questions, um, yeah, you can just uh, pose in the chat and the writer, writers um, will get to them during the Q&A, uh, excuse me. I've got my chat. <laughs> Sorry, it's always one technical difficulty and hopefully that's it. So, um, I'll, yes, I'll, 
you can pose your questions in the chat and they will be uh, seen to in the Q&A segment later. If you're watching via Facebook on the embassy's channels or that of any of the event partners, please also get in touch via the comments section and we'll try to read as many as we can. Later, we will hear Roddy read from his new book, Love, and we will also hear actor Stefan Schad read from the German translation. This will be followed by the Q&A, so please start thinking now about what you would like to ask Roddy and Rob. Now, before I bring on tonight's guests, I'd like to hand over to Dr. Nicholas O'Brien, Ireland's ambassador to Germany, to say a few words. Guten Abend, meine Damen und Herren. Mein Name ist Nicholas O'Brien und ich bin der Botschafter Irlands in Deutschland. Wir freuen uns sehr darauf, Sie zu diesem besonderen literarischen Event begrüßen zu dürfen, das von der Botschaft in Berlin ausgerichtet wird. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Nicholas O'Brien, Ireland's ambassador to Germany. We're delighted that you could join us for a very special literary event presented by the Embassy here this evening. We are thrilled to welcome two highly regarded and acclaimed writers to discuss their work and new literary offerings, Roddy Doyle and Rob Doyle. Now, Roddy Doyle is a writer that hardly needs an introduction. As one of Ireland's most celebrated contemporary writers, he has written countless top-selling novels for adults and children as well as numerous screenplays. Since its release in 1991, The Commitments has left an indelible impression of Dublin on millions of people around the world, a charming and endearing impression of a unique time in the city's history. The Commitments also launched the career of many Irish musical and film stars, and I think it's fair to say was a defining moment in Irish culture. Roddy's books and films have moved the world and have carved out a place for him as one of Ireland's most recognisable cultural figures. His new book, Love, was released to critical acclaim last year in English and we're delighted that it will be released this month in German under the title Love, Alles was du liebst. It was translated by Sabina Lengsfeld and read as an audiobook by Stefan Schad. It brings us great joy to see the work of such a widely celebrated Irish writer translated to the German language and to be enjoyed by so many more people. Rob Doyle is a young Irish writer who's been attracting great interest from readings and critics alike. His first novel, Here Are the Young Men, was adapted to film and released in cinemas in Ireland this year. The Berlin-based writer is one of our most valued artistic community here in Germany and featured in our new Irish Creatives Festival last year. As one of our community here, it's extremely exciting to watch his career progress. The two writers have a lot in common, not only their second name, they're also both true dubs. Roddy hails from Kilbarrick and Rob from Crumlin. They also have both their books, both had their books adapted to screen, depicting Dublin in their unique ways. Their books, however, encompass varying themes, I'm sure the two writers can compare their differing perspectives tonight in a way that will bring us much insight. But with so much in common, we're sure that tonight's discussion between the two writers will be not only enlightening, but also entertaining. Before we hear from Roddy and Rob, I'd like to mention that we're also delighted to cooperate with bookshops from across Germany this evening. Curious Fox Books here in Berlin, the Munich Reader in Munich, and Varia Varder in Dusseldorf have all helped spread the word of this exciting meeting of great literary minds this evening. I'd just like to add that followers of these bookshops can get involved with tonight's event on their social media platforms. Ich bedarfe mich bei Ihnen allen, dass Sie heute dabei sind und ich hoffe, dass Sie viele Freunde an der Diskussion finden werden. Vielen Dank. Yes, uh, the Booker Prize winning novelist Roddy Doyle is one of Ireland's best known contemporary writers 
having written so many well-loved books for adults and children, as well as screenplays and short stories. And he's joining us tonight from Clontarf in Dublin. And also joining us tonight from a Martello Tower in Dublin, where he is currently on a writer's residency, is Rob Doyle. So welcome, Rob and Roddy. Um, so tonight's event was organized to mark the release of Roddy Doyle's new book, Love, that was this month released in German with the title Love, Alles was du liebst. And the idea of having Berlin-based writer Rob Doyle host the conversation with Roddy about his new book seemed to fit so well. But I must admit that while this was being planned, um, although I was aware that Rob's new book, Autobibliography, was coming out later this year, I didn't realize that it would actually be out tomorrow. And not only that, but in it, he talks about the influence that Roddy had on him and his writing. So it seems as though the stars have really aligned for tonight's event. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Roddy Doyle and, and Rob Doyle, and I'll hand the conversation over to them. Thank you, Candice. Um, good evening, everybody, and welcome. Almost for as long as I've been reading books, Roddy Doyle has been writing them. When I was a kid, everyone in my family read the Barrytown trilogy uh, of novels, The Commitments, The Snapper and The Van, and then kept reading the books that followed. Nothing like them had ever been seen in Irish fiction for their minimalism of style, their irreverent com comedic treatment of working class family life, their feel for slang and popular culture and all of the stuff that people like me and my family and fairly much everybody I knew cared about. Uh, ever since Do uh, Roddy Doyle has been among um, our most, most widely read uh, and prolific of writers uh, as the ambassador and Candice mentioned, he won the Booker Prize in 1993 for Paddy Clark, ha ha ha, uh, among many other honors. And he has written many novels for adults, for children. Uh, again, as, as the ambassador mentioned, screenplays, plays. Um, there's nonfiction in there. Uh, a a, a co-written book with Roy Keane comes to mind. Um, and, and, and all sorts. He's also the co-founder of and chairman of Fighting Words, the organization which helps children and young people um, discover the pleasures and the freedoms, the liberation of, of writing. And I'm delighted to talk to him this evening about his wonderful uh, novel, Love. Um, so Roddy, it, 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 as I read it, Love is, um, it's a novel imbued with uh, a sense of loss and melancholy mm -hmm. and uh, the past, you know, the past looms so large in it. Um, the, the structure is, is, is bold and, and intriguing. Uh, it's all set over one night and it kind of, we, we, two, two men in middle, late middle age, as they describe it, are drinking in the kind of haunts of their youth. And as they do so, they're getting deeper and deeper into the past. And, 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 and the book just seems to me to be so much about the past and how it haunts us how we fantasize about it, how we idealize it, or see it differently than other people do, and so on. So uh, almost as soon as I was reading it, I realized, well, we're, we're, we're into some deep emotional territory here. So I just want to ask, what prompted you to explore these themes? Well, I think anybody who has siblings or who grew up with close friends with whom they've stayed in touch will be aware that there are occasions if not always where we think we share a memory but actually we often don't somebody else's version of what happened 40 years ago can be significantly different even though we might recall that we were there we saw everything we remember what was said what was done yet sitting back and listening to their version it's either hugely different or a little bit different. And it struck me some time ago that we make up our memories as much as we actually remember. 
And as I get older, that becomes more significant because there are more memories to, you know, hang on to. And um, so when I started the book, I think it was around about late nine, uh, 2017, early 2018. Uh, that's all I had in mind, really, two men meeting. They don't really know each other that well anymore, but for a couple of significant years in their youth, they effectively lived one life. Almost. As one man, yeah. Yeah. While I was writing the book, my mother, who was at the time 91, fell ill. And something told me, well, you know, this was coming up to the end of her life. And it, it, it was the case. So she died four months later. And myself, my siblings tried to uh, do the best we could. She was in hospital for a while and then went home to the house she'd lived in with my father since 1951. It's what she wanted to do. And then spent the remaining week of her life in the local hospice, which was a huge relief to all concerned in many, many ways because it lifted so much anxiety off us. We didn't have to worry about her um, medication or things like that. And we could just sit and chat. Uh, or just sit silently until she died. Also, while this happened, one of my closest friends was diagnosed with a brain tumour. Now, while my mother was 91 and my father had died some years beforehand at the age of 90, really, really sad when people died, but it wasn't tragic insofar as they'd had both good, full, as far as I know, happy lives, and they were quite healthy up towards until the very end. My friend, on the other hand, was the exact same age as me. He was a month younger than me. We'd known each other since we were 12, and I had every intention of spending the rest of my life in his company and with a couple of other people. But he died. Uh, luckily, he wasn't in any pain, but the decline was just really so shocking. And uh, he, he lost his memory. And you could have a conversation with him for hours, but it was on a loop. You know, same conversation again and again about Bob Dylan, Stevie Wonder. You go back to Bob Dylan and it was a brand new conversation. He'd vivid, he knew Bob Dylan and the music was playing constantly in Beaumont Hospital and in his home. But I wasn't writing really at all during this time uh, between visiting my mother and trying to care for my mother. And, uh, and when I got back to the novel, some weeks after my mother died, and while my friend was still alive, I had a stronger sense of what I wanted to write. And it was an amazing, really an amazing experience. I think I harnessed the grief and the grief was quite awful. You know, the, the, the death of my friend in particular was so gut wrenching that um, I normally would spend maybe two years writing the first draft of a novel, you know, which, you know, yourself, it varies from book to book. Mm -hmm. In this case, I had the first draft done in three months. Wow. I just roared through the thing. And uh, I think that, that I think this meeting of two men became much more urgent because of the death of my friend, Ronnie. And then I also knew quite quickly how I was going to end the novel, which was a huge, you know, it seems almost cynical to um, take an experience, such a personal experience that wasn't only my experience, but the experience of my siblings as well. But it just struck me as a way to use that occasion creatively. And I think it's around, it, it, may, it may well be the first time where I've, I've known how I'm going to end a novel, you know? Mm -hmm. That in itself, I mean, it, it's a gift in some ways because it's always a constant anxiety. How's this thing gonna end? How is the plane gonna land? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and you know, is the airport is that the airport i'm not sure if it's the airport there's just these lights in a straight line but it may well be henry street <laughs> you know so um it all came together very quickly and then to flip it over i spent a year editing the thing because it was a total mess you know structurally a complete mess but i think and um, so i the emotional side of it which rarely it, it's it, it's rarely conscious it was hugely conscious when I wrote this particular book, but then I kind of took my emotions and put them on the shelf behind me here and started looking at it coldly as an, I edit my own work really mm. for the year and was throwing stuff and hacking and, you know, changing words, dropping words, restructuring the novel. Um, 
trying to, one of the challenges, Rob, was trying to capture the spoken language of men as they get drunk or during the course of the evening. Oh, yeah. And they've kind of, one of them emigrated. He's lived in England longer than he lived in Ireland. And that must have an impact on us. And he loves coming back to Dublin and, if you like, putting on his Dublin accent again. Oh, yeah. He says it's like taking exercise. He loves speaking it because it's like taking yeah. exercise. And the other guy has always lived in Dublin, but it, you know, I didn't specify what they do for a living, but it's clear he's done okay. So yeah. the rough edges have been polished a little bit. And of course they're older, but as they get drunker and drunker and they're living their old life and, you know, arguing about what happened and what didn't happen, they basically in a way become uh, wrinkled versions of their old selves. And I, I, I actually really enjoyed uh, not just the drunkenness of their language, but bringing them right back to 40 years and kind of, um, so that was a painstaking, pleasurable experience, really. I suppose it might be a little bit like knitting. I'm not sure. Never done. <laughs> it was very, it was almost physical. Yeah, good. Well, just to stay a kind of secondary question about this, um, uh, th this notion that the, the book kind of almost came to you really quickly and you, you knew a lot about it, which sounds like it's not usually the case, you know, you knew how it ended and so on. Did you know from the outset that it was all going to be set over one night? Because that no. was a striking thing for me. There's no chapters as such. It's just yeah. this unfolding kind of drinking bout that, that that spins into the past and the present. Did you know that about it? No, no, but it did become a decision quite early. It made sense. So they start off in a kind of I suppose a middle class, middle aged milieu instead of meeting in the pub. And this is pre pandemic when you could do that without, you know, bringing your passport and permission, a letter, <laughs> permission from your guardian, you know. Mm -hmm. um, instead of meeting in a pub, they were meeting in a restaurant, which is something they would never, ever, ever have done when they were 21. Mm -hmm. Never. Um, so this was, you know, and then one of them puts the idea we'll go for a drink. And then I thought, yeah, this is where we're going here now. So they have more drink and more. And then they do the wild thing for men their age. They get into a taxi and go into the city centre. And it made sense to have it, you know, one night, one intense night. And there's a, a feeling I felt quite early on, I'm going to bring them to the brink here. Mm. You know, what's more important? Their truth, you know, which they refuse to, in a way, share. Or... The friendship and the possibility of them remaining friends for the rest of their lives and i thought i'd bring them right to the brink and the way to do that was to stay with them all the way all the way and um that took a lot of editing strangely you would think in some ways that actually a book spread across a year would take more careful editing than a book that occupies maybe four or five hours of their lives but actually it was the opposite I can imagine just from reading it because it's the intricate way that it uh, shifts back and forth. Mm -hmm. Like it could be if done wrongly or if insufficiently edited, that could be very confusing. You know, where, where yeah. are we now? When are we now? Uh, but it doesn't, it, it, it flows, it reads. It's, it's, it's highly readable, uh, even though it's quite, from all of your work I'm familiar with, it's quite f structurally and formally quite different. But um, I want to get back in a few minutes to ask you more about this question of, of booze, of, of pubs and alcohol and stuff in the novel. But first, um, just a, a word about Dublin, because um, like so many of your books, it's a, it's, a, it's a pure Dublin novel, you know, where you're naming the specific pubs that they're going to and the places that they're hanging out and the streets and uh, everything. Uh, the themes are maybe universal in a sense, you know, they're existential themes about memory and the past and mortality and all of that stuff, but it's pure Dublin, um, as I suppose you're, you're famous for, um, that if it doesn't sound too choosy, cheesy to say, Dublin seems like it's always been your muse to a degree, um, but you show it here in simpler times you know we, we we have lots of snapshots of um te telling signs of contemporary dublin as it is in the late 2010s or uh thereabouts but then we keep flashing back to 
a simpler time and specifically we're talking the early 80s i believe um and as one of the characters says he says I, I i really don't think i'm being sentimental here you know he's talking about the past and he knows there's a risk of pure nostalgia and sentimentality and i had a feeling you were playing the same game the same gambit you know uh, i so i just want to ask were you nostalgic for that period of dublin life irish life uh, when you were writing it specifically writing these scenes set in the past not really I, I don't think i was obviously thinking a lot about it because of the time i would have shared with my friend who was dying and then died and we haunted the same pubs at the weekend and it was even though we were you know 20 21 22 and we were you know up and running we were working we had the vote we were adults and quite content in our adulthood it it just seemed we were shifting out of our suburb and moving into a city so to speak if that makes sense and that we were we, we were being acknowledged by barmen in these pubs in a way that hadn't happened before so it was as if we were being let into this world and uh, it was very um, I think seductive is probably too strong a word. You know, you go into a pub in Dublin, I don't think you're being seduced unless, unless you're extremely lucky. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, uh, but there is something wonderful about it. And I was trying, in terms of language and the way the men, the young men speak, I was trying to be faithful to the way they would have been 40 years ago and trying to make sure that I wasn't actually putting it the gloss of myself at my own age now, but also, if you like, the way as a society Ireland has changed, trying not to let myself see it through that lens or through that filter. So the use of the word girl, for example, you know, uh, if it was if it was today those characters might refer to a woman instead of a girl mm -hmm. and they'd never use the word a bird to describe a woman today yeah. you know but yeah. they did back then so i did in the book you know i was yeah. trying to be very faithful to it i i sometimes feel that people use the word nostalgia or nostalgic way too readily as if setting something in the past is nostalgic and we mm -hmm. can you know uh, we can we can point out films we've seen that are set in the past that are in no way nostalgic and I, I tried just to make sure that it was somehow faithful and actually um also somehow important enough to both men to want them to stick together you know just to do the work that you need to do to maintain the friendship for the rest of their lives but it did become quite vivid you know some of the pubs that I refer to like the palace, for example, they go into the palace bar on um, Fleet Street. Yeah. I was in there a few weeks ago, you know, uh, and normally if you you would know that on a Friday at five o'clock, if you want to get into the palace, normally you would need a machete to get through the crowd into the palace. But because of the restrictions, myself and my wife just went up to the door and showed our, you know, vaccine passports and walked in and found so it was it was different in that regard very very different to the atmosphere uh that these characters and myself would have walked into 40 years ago but the place is intact i'm not aware that they've done anything with it really uh except they changed the bulb in the men's toilet so you can actually see and uh, then you're down there but oh, yeah. the bar itself is still the same it's much the same in Kyo's as well on south Dan street peter's pub uh they they Built, built into another premises beside it, but it's the same black and white color. And so a lot of the pubs, despite what people say about oh, everything's changed, whatever, a lot of the pubs are basically the same as they used to be, yeah. except I think maybe less male dominated perhaps, um, yeah. which is a good thing. But uh, so I had a great night with two friends when I asked them, would they be my research fellows and come to the pubs where the fictional men go, starting with the sheds, Connolly's about a 10 minute walk from where I'm sitting now. No, no great that's, hardship. That's there. what I call research. That's my idea of research. Yeah. Didn't bother pub. applying for a grant. Thought, 
<laughs> I prefer to paddle my own canoe. But, uh, so we just had a few pints in the in the first pub. Is it as if I, you know, I was looking around. They hadn't read the, the manuscript. I'm looking around. Yeah, that's okay. I took a, a little note on my phone. I'll add that detail. And then we went on to the Palace Bar. And I was looking around. Yeah, that's grand, as described. You know, on to the next one. So that was as much formal research I did. We went to the pubs that the men are in. And actually, Neary's, you know, Neary's. Yeah, yeah. Same place, really. Is it? And it's a lovely pub, Neary's, actually. Absolutely lovely pub. And, you know, if there are any changes in the 40 years, I don't. I didn't notice any. It's the same. The red upholstery and that kind of thing. The, yeah, the... yeah, that slightly seedy David Lynch. Yeah. Uh, you, you know, you, you, you're waiting for the dwarf to come out from behind the velvet curtain. But um, <laughs> other than that, I mean, great pubs, really. You know? Yeah, but, yeah. yeah. Kyo's, uh, I don't know. That's uh, that's the only one I, I, I didn't remember. Well, it's like Kehoe's, Kyo's on South Down Street. Yeah, I don't think I've, maybe no, I've no. seen it from the outside. I don't think so, no. Maybe I'm no. sure I've passed by it, but I, I, couldn't, I couldn't place it in my head. Oh, it's a lovely pub. Yeah. Well, um, staying on this topic of well, pubs and drinking and so on, you know, drink is kind of crucial to the, the to the the story because it's yeah. it's the lubricant, it's the accelerant, mm -hmm. um, it's the, the the kind of alchemizer of 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 whatever is happening at this kind of transitional stage of life for these two men. Um, but it was funny because. I, I, I had a look at some of the reviews of uh, the, the novel and that had been published elsewhere, outside of Ireland. And a lot of them kind of really talked about it as, uh, you know, this is such a hard drinking kind of novel. And I, I, Maybe it's a damning um, indicator of my lifestyle to date, but as I was kind of reading it, I kind of thought, no, nah, these guys, they didn't strike me as hard drinkers, you know? And I, it feels like every time a pint is set down on the table, they're, both of them are kind of saying, I don't want this. And the mm. other one is going, yeah, but we're, we're locked into something now, you know, there's yeah. a certain momentum. But they don't really want, they're not, it's not, um, it's not youthful, exuberant, ecstatic drinking for the kind of the euphoric, um, you know, the, the euphoric buzz or high. It's it, there's something more stoical about it or something. Um, yeah. And I suppose they have they do have what five or six points over the, the course of the night. I think it's a few um, more. I actually count them. I can't. Is it? Them. OK, well, then may, maybe maybe I'm wrong. And it is a it is a it's a hard drinking novel. All right. But there was somebody who read an early draft who thought it might be unfeasible to drink that much. And I had to assure her <laughs> so, it's perfectly feasible. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, could have, I could have got a few more pints into them and they'd still have been upright. Oh, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, so they're, they're kind of traditional Irish men uh, of their generation. Yes. In, in some ways. And they, you know, they they use the alcohol because um, they're a bit reserved with each other. There are certain topics that they find it quite a bit awkward to broach with each other and the booze loosens them up and so on. So yeah, just maybe just tell me a bit about alcohol's role in the novel yeah. uh, and, and in your work in general, if you want. Well, I'd have to think into the box to think where does, well, you know, there's a, there are alcoholics and the, the, uh, the woman who walked into the door is uh, Paula Spencer is an alcoholic mm -hmm. and that's a big, big part of the book. Um, but I think the, the importance of the pub and the, not so much the drinking hmm. because they're they, basically they're in the pub. So they drink. I mean, um, men of my generation, we don't really are, are, are of our background. We don't really visit each other's houses. You know, uh, we'd ask, you know, how's the family grand? And we move on to the football. And we don't visit each other's houses. We, we, we always met in the pub. We were teenagers, yeah, we, you know, whoever had the best record player and the most amenable parents, we'd descend on the house and blare out whatever we were listening to. Uh, but after that, once we were up and running and had money in our pockets, we never went to each other's houses and really had no interest in doing it. And, you know, it was the pub you met in, for better or for worse. It was it, it, a vital part of our culture. It's, it, it's our club, if you like, the local. And the men in this book, they're, in a way, they're committed to going that route again. My sense of it is that, you know, I didn't, that, that they don't really drink that much anymore. The narrator particularly, I suspect, um, 
gets a bit tricky when he's drunk and has, it's put him in awkward situations and he's had difficult times with his wife, I suspect. It, it, I don't know if I ever state it, but it's hinted at strongly. And he pulled the brake on his drinking some years beforehand. Mm. Possibly not an alcoholic, but probably somebody who don't, shouldn't really drink too much. Mm. And the other guy really, I suppose, having a family, whatever, knocked that habit out of him in many, many ways. So they're, what they're doing this night is um, a novelty in some ways. And I felt, as you were talking about it, I was thinking about it, it's almost as if they're doing a sponsored drink, you know, that almost they're doing it for charity, you know, yeah, yeah. some endurance, a marathon that they have to endure. And yeah, I, I, I found it really easy to imagine them not wanting the next pint, particularly if it's gone a bit warm, you know, and it's, uh, but uh, they keep on at it. And they keep on at it. Yeah. But um, I. It's also as well as a sponsored drink. It's also kind of a, a like a cover version of their own youthful days yes. when they really were lashing the pints back. Yeah, and, when they could, and they were, and that it, in a way, it's also it is a limiting thing. Almost, they defined the transition from. Um, the teenager into the adult by first the pubs they were drinking in and then probably the volume of alcohol that they were capable of drinking. That's a different discussion that could go on for weeks, really. Yeah. But I didn't notice during when the first lockdown here, um, I didn't drink really at all. I had no interest in, outside of the context of the pub, an occasional can of uh, you know, beer if I was watching something at the weekend on the TV. Uh, but other than that, I'd really no, no interest in the um, in the alcohol. But I did miss the opportunity to go down to the pub and chat to my friends. Oh, really, yeah. yeah, that's uh, interesting. I, I heard a few people saying that about it. I had the opposite thing. I was like, God, there is no pub. So there was no good reason not to drink at home. So in the end, <laughs> I just had to knock it on the head. It's like, no, it's <laughs> way too, e way too easy. <laughs> um, uh, it's just um, another thing. Um, I was going to ask you about men and just the, the whole the whole vexed issue of right these days. But but first, something else comes up in my mind, and that's um, and I suppose this one really does cover your whole career to date, including the early books, the middle books, and this book. But the question of class, social mm. class. Um, you know, people say in Ireland it's not as entrenched a thing as in British society, and, and I'm sure there's truth to that. But still, there's um, there's lots of subtle class um, yeah. stuff going yeah. on in this novel. And uh, as you as you described this scene earlier, they go these young guys go into the pub, and it's a bit of a middle class boozer, you know, and they're in there, and there are people putting their violins down and stuff and you know it is a bit of an orchestra you know drinking in there and they feel there's a kind of um an excitement and a, a kind of wanting to belong and so on but also a bit of an awkwardness and and then this woman who they massively both kind of idealize at the time and see as this uh ultimate woman of their dreams um is seemingly a higher social class a bit posh whatever you want to call it and um, so yeah i'm just curious about your your thoughts on class in this novel and in the roddy doyle uh, body of work to date really class is vitally important i know that i've i've read and i've heard and been told that there's no real class structure in ireland which um like it's pretty brazen thing to say given it's complete and utter lie <laughs> it's probably not as glaringly obvious as it is perhaps in britain right. uh because of accent, because of school, but it's there and it's subtle in some places and it's not in other places. And um, it struck me some time ago that as Ireland has opened up socially, um, class has been forgotten about in a way. Uh, it's, we talk about gender, we talk about race, we talk about sexual identity. But class somehow or other has been relegated to something insignificant. And yet to me, it's vital. Uh, what is important to you is often a reflection of the chunk of Dublin that you come from or the chunk of the city or the countryside that you come from. And these two men, these two young men, they just go into a pub on the south side of Dublin and they see glimpses of life that they 
didn't know. They probably knew it was there from observation, from reading, you know, but they, they were never so close to it before. And the, the, the three people who have their musical instruments with them, this is a brand new thing. And it's not guitar cases, it's violin and cello. And they try to imagine what that's like. And they've never seen an orchestra. And certainly I had never seen an orchestra when I was their age. They haven't really been to the theater. Um, and they see kind of men and women who might be 10 years older than them at ease with one another. And that back in the early 80s was a difficult thing to achieve. If you look back, education was completely separate. Boys went to boys' schools, girls went to girls' schools. Uh, we were actively encouraged to think of women as being a bit suspect, you know, the, the, you know, in school. Look, hopeless failure, but that was the way it was perceived, a distraction. Don't let the women distract you. It's a little bit evil almost, you know? To, mm -hmm. um, and of course, we knew it was nonsense, but at the same time, Ew, yeah. That, that, that was part of the Irish education. So I tried to get my head right back to that. And they're looking at these men and women who clearly are at ease together, elegant in a way that they've never seen. You know, my father was quite an elegant man. And the reason why I can say that, because nobody else was. <laughs> you know? He literally stood out, you know, and it took it was, a, a, I think, a lot of work on his part to to be the man he wanted to be, you know, that bit is very unusual, you know. And um, so, and he, because he wanted to be more than uh, just a working class man, a printer, he wanted to put his own stamp on himself. So he, he um, you know, he won a prize as an apprentice and bought a pipe. You know, he thought he'd look great with a pipe. He was 17 or something when this happened. And uh, he'd spend money on a hat. And, you know, um, not that he wanted to lift himself out of his origins, but he wanted to be, I think, in that sense, a self-made man, you know, not to wear the uniform of his class. And uh, I think these guys yearn for something a bit like that as well the jacket that the guy over there is wearing, the leather jacket that that fellow over there is wearing that he seems to have been born in. This is what they'd like. But class plays a huge role in, in everything I've done. And I think in part it's to do with my politics, but it's also to do with the zone I grew up in myself, you know, in that uh, I had a foot really in, I, I lived in a kind of gray area in that, um, my mother's background was more, there was a farm in Wexford, so there was land. And uh, her father was a civil servant. And there was a solidity insofar as they, she grew up in the same house all the time. Uh, went to school till she was 18, you know? So uh, you could say we should, her, her background in Dublin was middle class. My father, a big, big family, uh, moved house a lot until they settled in Tala, where his mother came from. Left school at the age of 15 to take up a printing apprentice, apprenticeship. No books in the house at all until my grandmother brought home a box of books she bought at an auction and didn't know what to do with them. And my father started reading them. But there were none in the house, literally none in the house. And um, so he... The, the two of them then met and obviously they, they, they got married and they brought into the house that I grew up in these two different backgrounds and experiences and family stories, you know. My father had countless cousins, absolutely count. We could be distant cousins for all we know, Rob, because, you know, there's, not, there's no shortage of toils. <laughs> <laughs> you know? And then my mother could count all the cousins she had, knew where they were exactly, except on her mother's side of the family, which was a complete mystery. She didn't know anything about them. So that's what I grew up with, in that kind of, with one foot in each camp, so to speak. And it's always interested me how, how um, a lot of people in Ireland, because of the shift economically from the foundation of the state to where we are now, a lot of people are in that grey area. And then there's other people from, you know, the more the, who've, who've gone to Jesuit schools or whatever, who've never been out of the middle class. They probably kind of count for themselves going back 200 years, 
you know, in terms of their families and where they went and probably went to the exact same school that their grandfathers went to, yeah. you know, and it's a different, and I'm very aware of it. And I think when I became a writer or when I became a published writer and I was in the company of people, in a, you know, in a large room standing there awkwardly with a glass of wine and listening to people talking, I hadn't a clue what they were talking about in the, it was like listening to a different language, not just a different dialect or a different set of priorities, but sometimes listening to a different language. I had no idea what they were talking about. And the, 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 the loyalty to the school, men in their 50s talking as if they were teenagers about the school they went to. Uh, and I, 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 I never felt any, I hated the bloody school I went to, you know, couldn't wait for that. Like and um, I don't know anybody who looks back fondly at the school we went to and says, rah, 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 I wonder how we're doing in the football. You know, nobody cared. A dump, you know, um, run by psychopaths and couldn't wait to get out of the place. Yeah. And that was my schooling experience and it got me nowhere as far as I can make out. You know? So, um, but it's interesting. As a writer, it's interesting. Um, sure, yeah. And how um, people, yeah. Yeah. Uh, how about uh, a reading at that point, Roddy? Or, or yeah. some more if you felt like it? I'll read a little bit, yeah, if you want. Yeah, please, yeah. go ahead. So this is the uh, British edition of the book. I'm going to read about, it's about pubs, which seems quite apt. And I'm going to hold up the new German edition of the book for, you know, this is a thing of beauty. And one of the joys, one of the really nice things about this particular book is that the covers have been so contrasting. So this is the German color. And I'm really, really um, happy with it. So this is, um, this isn't, doesn't form part of the narrative, really. It's a, it's a deliberate interruption coming towards the end of the book where Davy, the narrator, just tries to, almost explain the importance of the pub as a, a cultural thing. Pubs, the world of men. There were women too, but the world, the pub, was made by men, put there for men. There were no women serving, no lounge girls, very few women sitting on the stools along the counters. Dark wood, old mirrors, smoke-drenched walls and ceilings, and photographs of men. Jockeys, footballers, men drinking, writers, all men, rebels, boxers. The women were guests, the men were at home. There was a day I parked myself on a stool, and although I'd never sat on it before, I knew it was mine. All of the stools were mine. That particular stool was in George's, but it was the stool we found in every pub in Dublin. I'd discovered my life, the shy man's heaven. A string of pubs connected by streets and lanes, the streets in plain sight but secret. Pool Bag Street, Sackville Place, Fleet Street, Essex Street, Dame Lane, Wicklow Street, Exchequer Street, South William Street, Chatham Street, Chatham Row, Duke Street, South Ann Street, Duke Lane, George's Street, Fade Street, Drury Street, Stephen Street, Coppinger Row, Johnson's Court, South King Street. The streets were sometimes crowded, sometimes deserted, but only we knew why they were there, their real hidden purpose. They got us to Mulligan's, Bowes, the Sackville Lounge, the International, the Stag's Head, the Dame Tavern, the Long Hall, the Dawson Lounge, Neary's, Rice's, Sheehan's, the Hogan Stand, Grogan's, Kyo's, the Duke, the Palace, George's. The one big pub, the Dublin pub, the light, the smoke, the other men. We were men with other men, the voices, the man at the bar of Sheen's telling other men and telling us how he'd escaped from John of God's where he'd been sent by his sons to dry out. His eyes watered, his hands shook as he reached for his glass, but his voice told us what lay ahead and what we already had. So this chap stands up and he says, my name's Jim and I am an alcoholic. And another chap gets up and he says, my name's Fergus and I'm an alcoholic as well. And then the chap sitting beside me, he gets up and he says, my name's Paddy and I'm an alcoholic. So then it seems to be my turn. They're all looking at me. So I stand up and I say, my name's Tommy and I'm going over the fucking wall the minute it gets dark enough. The laughter, the love, defiance, nothing about him scared us. The voice in Mulligan's, the deep voice that shook the glasses on the nearer tables, although it was never loud. Today's cunt was what we called him. He'd see us come in. He was always there. Today's cunt is Charlie Hoy. Or today's cunt is Leonid Brezhnev. 
He never repeated a name. Hawhey, Brezhnev, Reagan, uh, Johnny Logan, Thatcher, Mr. T, Garrett Fitzgerald, Gary Bertels, Pat Spillan. Today's cunts are Def Leppard. He worked in the Irish press, one of the barmen told us, but he was there wherever, whenever we walked in. There was the man with the suit and ponytail who read the New Statesman. He sat for hours at the bar. He stood, he left. He ordered his gin and tonic without opening his mouth. He paid for it, he took his change. He never spoke a world, a word, the world of men, where they, where we, could be who we wanted to be, who and what we were going to be. Today's cunt is the Reverend Ian Paisley. The men stepped out of a world into their real world, the secret one, the sacred one, the one that only men knew. Today's cunt is Billy Ocean. Everything outside was an act, an endurance. Inside the pub, that was where life was. Nothing mattered. That was all that mattered. We entered it. I thought we'd stay there. Great. Thank you, Roddy. I've no idea why I brought in Billy Ocean. <laughs> um, and Def Leppard, what did they ever do to you? But uh, as, well, as I hit, you're... mean musically, I hated them, but Billy so Ocean, I, well, I actually yeah. quite like Billy Ocean. Yeah, yeah. But as you were reading it, it struck me that because the novel was first published in uh, English, I think in early summer 2020, just when the pandemic and the lockdowns were happening, uh, it, it, it could have provided, it must have provided its first readers with a kind of almost like a virtual reality headset for the Irish pub experience, mm -hmm. the Dublin pub experience. I, I think you should develop a, a VR version where yeah. it's just in the pub. I was thinking as I read the names of the pubs, I might go on a big expedition just to check that they're all still open. <laughs> I think you could. <laughs> you deserve it. <laughs> With a miner's helmet, you know. <laughs> Yeah. Um, OK, so thanks again, Roddy. And now, everybody, um, we're going to uh, go now for a, a, a quick reading in um, German, the, the German version of the novel uh, known as Love, Alice, Was Du Liebst. It's going to be read by Stefan Schad. And, um, but for the English speakers in the crowd, um, you know, this will just be four or five minutes. So if you want to get a cup of tea or something, but do come back because then... We're going to have a Q&A, so all of the questions that have come in for, for Roddy, uh, we'll, we'll have plenty of chance to talk. So here's the reading from um, Stefan Schad. Dies ist ein Hörerlebnis von Goya Lit aus dem Hause Jumbo Neue Medien und Verlag GmbH. Er wusste sofort, dass sie es war, erzählte er mir. Er erzählte mir das ein Jahr, nachdem er sie wieder getroffen hatte. Genau vor einem Jahr, sagte er. Genau vor einem Jahr? Sag ich doch, Davy. Vor einem Jahr, gestern vor einem Jahr. Du kannst dich ans Datum erinnern? Ja klar. Jesus, Joe. Er entdeckte sie am Ende eines Flurs und wusste es. Unmittelbar. Sie hatte sich nicht verändert obwohl er sie nur aus der Ferne sah, obwohl sie nur ein Umriss war, ein dunkler, schlanker Schatten, eine Silhouette inmitten des Spätnachmittagslichts, das hinter ihr durch die Glastür fiel, wusste er es. »Sie war nie schlank«, sagte ich. Er zuckte mit den Achseln. »Ich weiß gar nicht, was schlank eigentlich heißen soll«, meinte er und grinste. »Ich auch nicht«, gab ich zurück. »Hab ich einfach nur so gesagt«, sagte er. »Schlank, okay. Vielleicht eher...« ein großer Schatten. Okay, kein rundlicher. Sie hat sich gut gehalten, sagte ich. Das willst du mir doch damit sagen. Genau, sagte er. Das hat sie wirklich. Wo war dieser Flur, fragte ich ihn. In der Schule. In welcher Schule? Na, in der Schule, wiederholte er. In der Schule kannten wir sie noch gar nicht, sagte ich. Mir war klar, dass er nicht die Schule meinte, auf die wir gegangen waren. So lange kannten wir uns schon. Ich hatte das nur gesagt, also, dass wir sie nicht von der Schule kannten, weil ich ihn dazu bringen wollte, wieder er selbst zu sein. Ich wollte eine Antwort hören, über die wir lachen konnten. Er war der Witzige von uns. »Die Schule meiner Kinder.« »Moment«, sagte ich. »Beim Elternsprechtag?« »Genau.« »Die Frau deiner Träume trat aus der Sonne heraus und hinein in einen Elternsprechtag?« Yep. »Dreißig Jahre, nachdem du sie zum letzten Mal gesehen hast«, sagte ich. »Nein.« Mehr, viel mehr. 
sechs oder 37 Jahre. Genau, sagte er. Kommt ungefähr hin. Was hast du eben gesagt? Sie trat aus der Sonne heraus? Glaub schon, ja. Tja, sagte er. Genau so war's. Ich lebte nicht mehr in Irland. Drei, viermal im Jahr flog ich nach Dublin rüber, um meinen Vater zu besuchen. Früher hatte ich immer meine Familie mitgenommen, aber seit ein paar Jahren kam ich allein. Die Kinder waren inzwischen groß und aus dem Haus und meine Frau Fay flog nicht gern und auf die Fahrt nach Holyhead mit der Fähre war sie auch nicht sonderlich erpicht. Sie gab mir einen Kuss, sagte Joe jetzt. Auf dem Flur? Der Mann, den ich kannte oder den ich zu kennen glaubte, den ich früher kannte, der hätte jetzt »Nein, auf den Arsch« oder etwas in der Art geantwortet. »Ja«, sagte er. »Sie hat mich wiedererkannt.« »Ich ihn nicht. Früher kannte ich ihn besser.« Okay. Hello again. That was uh, Stefan Schad reading Love, Alles, was du liebst, um, the German translation of Love by Roddy Doyle. Uh, okay, Roddy, so I've got some questions coming in here from various uh, sources. There's Facebook, there's uh, Twitter, there's all sorts. So, uh, and there's even in the chat. So the first one uh, I have for you is from is from facebook daryl southern her daughter talia who's 10 10 years old says your rover books are so funny when can we collaborate <laughs> uh, when when maybe in terms of making a film perhaps Don't make any promises you can't keep, Roddy. That's I'm not going to make any promises, no. <laughs> But it's lovely that she would want to uh, collaborate in something creative, maybe based on the books. It's lovely to think that. But maybe she can aspire to that. Yeah. Or, or create her own characters, better yet. I got a lovely letter once from a, a, a child in England who had read the Rover books. And the letter started... Dear Roddy Doyle, I hope you are alive. <laughs> Drawing shade. <laughs> um, good. Uh, another one is um, um, mm -mm -mm. Uh, listen, it strikes me, uh, Niall says, it strikes me as listening to the audiobook. How well uh, do we think these Dublin stories translate to the German audience? And uh, that's kind of for both of us. So what, well, what do you think, Roddy? Well, I actually read a lot of books that are not originally written in English. I've recently been reading a lot of Japanese literature. Hmm. And it strikes me it's really well translated. And that's not based on the fact that I speak Japanese. I don't at all. But the rhythm seems very good. And it's very vivid. And I'm... At no point do I feel I'm, I'm, I'm tripping up here because of something that's doesn't quite, it jars a bit. Never. And I feel that's the same way with any work that's translated from one language into another, um, that as long as I feel safe in the hands of the translator, and I did, I really loved listening to the, um, the audio book there. And it's really nice to know, or it's, if you like, I feel educated because I now know that the German for Jesus Joe is Jesus Joe. Um, yeah. So no, no hard work there. Mm -hmm. But uh, so, I mean, in a way, ignorance is bliss, isn't it? But if we, um, but I do think, I mean, it's a bit like when I'm watching, uh, say, a, a television series set in Scandinavia, that so many of the words sound a bit familiar. And it's the same with the, when I listen to German. A lot of the words sound a bit familiar. Yeah, so there's, there's English in there somewhere that's yeah. trying to get out. Yeah. Yeah. So I think it's it's a bit foggy, but I can imagine a good translator kind of gets rid of that fog. So um, yeah, I think I mean, I'd uh, it's it, it, it's the translator's challenge, isn't it really? Yeah, it uh, just strikes me, and I wonder what you feel about this, Roddy. But um, I know your style. I would describe it if, even in the current book, um, but going right back to the commitments, which was the first one I read, I would describe it as minimalist. Mm. Um, I, I, I don't think that's even a controversial statement. I, you know, I think I feel like yeah, like I've read interviews with you where you talked about Bukowski as an influence. Yeah. 
on your style, on your on your early approach to writing. And he, of course, he really paired it back. Yeah. And uh, I wonder if that potentially makes your stuff very agreeable for translation, because probably yes and no, Rob. I don't know about your own experiences, but I think possibly the relative brevity of the sentences, particularly in the early books, the lack of description probably makes it easier to translate. I'd say a lot of the challenge is in the dialogue. Okay. How do you translate the Dublin accent as presented on the page into something that seems the same, but actually is in German or French? Or I've had you know, I, I have copies of books in Korean and Hebrew. How do you do that? And Japanese. At least with German, if you like, the roots of the languages are somewhat similar and the structure of the sentences are somewhat similar, whereas with Japanese, in a lot of cases, there's no literal translation. Yeah. So that's where the skill of the translator comes in. But and, and that's uh, I think maybe it makes it at one level easier to translate, but I would imagine it's more difficult to capture, perhaps you'd call it the spirit of the book as opposed to the word for word translation. I don't know. What do you think? Well, no, uh, it just struck me there as you were saying it, that that's before you even get to the question of Dublin slang and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, kind of colloquialisms and so on, of which your books tend to be uh, replete. So yeah. that's going to pose its, its own problem, too. Um, but, yeah, I no, I think what you're what you're saying sounds um, sounds good. Although the other thing is I hear uh, from what I understand of Ger Germans, in their literature, they love the long sentences, you know, even their words go on for twice the length of their sentences, <laughs> but their sentences go on for three paragraphs in their, in their, <laughs> in their way of writing. But uh, so God knows what they, I, I just had a memory that I'd completely forgotten all about. Uh, I used to live in Italy for a period, Roddy, and uh, in Sicily, and I was trying to learn the language by studying books and uh, grammar and stuff. And um, I bought, uh, a copy of E Commit e Commitmi or something like that. It was the commitments in Italian. And uh, I can't remember how good my Italian was at the at the time, but because it was so brief and short and punchy, and because I'd already read it, uh, it, it was actually quite I, I was able to kind of get through it, you know, to a degree. It wasn't yeah. uh, oh good, good. So the, the Italians, you're, you're doing all right over there, I think. Um, so uh, David Gordon asks, um, he's always loves, he always loves to hear about a, a writer's modus operandi. Uh, how many hours a day do you write? Where do you write a laptop or notebook? I'll just add something to this, uh, Roddy, which is that, um, I, you know, ever since I was a kid, as I said at the start, you've been part of the, the literary landscape, you know, and your books have been coming out regularly. But it was only when I was preparing for this um, event and to chat to you that I actually, for the first time, realized just how prolific you've been. And uh, mm -hmm. it's quite it's it's quite daunting, frankly. It, you, 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 you write a lot in a lot of different genres and seemingly simultaneously. So, uh, yeah, so just to get back to David's question, how many hours a day, where do you write and, and do you do it in a laptop or no? I write where I am now in my office and in the attic of my home. Uh, I use a laptop, I, go, I write straight onto a laptop. I have, it, I have it attached to a monitor, you know, so it's a big, bigger screen. So yeah. I'm not poured over the laptop. Um, I listen to music usually as I work which is, uh, it, it makes going up the stairs to work a little bit easier. And um, depending on what- lyrics or music with- uh, Again, it depends, but generally, no. You know, I just, you use the word minimalist. I, I, I listen to a lot of minimalist music, you know, and sometimes what's known as ambient music, yeah. but also quite a lot of jazz, you know? And it depends on the time of day. Sometimes late afternoon, I stick on something with a bit of energy because it seems to, you know, get a few more words out of me. The word count goes up if it's um, uh, Charles Mingus. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so I have him to count, I have him to thank for the last novel. But um, again, it depends. I, if, if you like, up until recently, I'm, I'm available for work from about nine o'clock to six. I don't always work from nine o'clock to six. And I get, when I gave up teaching I, 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 in 1993, I maintained the sort of Monday to Friday work and took the weekends off because I had at that stage I had young children and I um, 
I didn't think it was necessary to, you know, don't disturb your father. He's in the office uh, writing, capturing the spirit of his nation uh, on paper. I just thought, no, uh, it, does, it isn't necessary. So uh, there are no children in the house now, but I basically keep to the same routine. Um, again, some jobs are quite time consuming, others less so. I don't think I'll be writing for children again because my children are adults and the urge isn't there. Um, and I, I'd like each job to seem like an adventure. If the energy isn't in it, if I, I like, I, I always kind of test myself. I, I hate the notion of slipping into a rut somehow and writing a book because that's what I do. There has to be more going on, but that's been the way I felt from the very, very beginning. So, um, as long as the energy is there and it doesn't seem to be going anywhere, uh, I'll continue to to write, maybe at not at the same speed. Um, and the reason why, you know, the word prolific is often used as a almost like an accusation, really. You know, you've heard it. You didn't mean it that way. I know. I know you didn't. And I'd never for a minute yeah. think that. But I know that it has been used almost like he's written a lot. Therefore, he can't have written anything good. Okay. Uh, the only way to write a masterpiece is to disappear for 20 years and come back with it. You know, that type of yeah, bullshit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This joyce and but, mystical notion. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so um, I can't really account for why I've written so much. I think it is because, you know, when I, was, when I wrote The Commitments, which I self-published, there was almost immediately interested in the, interest in the film. And eventually I chose a director called Linda Miles. And she was keen that I have a go at the screenplay. So I did, oh, and it I ended know. up being co-written, but then for a while I wrote a lot of screenplays as well because I had, I, I, I had that skill. And I, I, um, it's, an, it's an extraordinary experience to, and I've been lucky, I think five times, to see something you put on paper as a foundation for a piece of work to become a, a film, the most recent being a film called Rosie three years ago. Quite an extraordinary experience. I, everything, every novel I've written, I've written because I want to write it. A lot of the other things I've written because somebody has suggested it to me. The Roy Keane book being a case in point. It never have occurred to me that to write a book in that way, on that subject, um, with that man. But I got a, a one and a half line email on a Friday afternoon from a publisher I didn't know, would you be interested in writing a book with Roy Keane? So immediately I was thinking, yes, I would, but will I? Or what? So I sat on it for a few days and then thought, well, I can park what I'm doing at the moment and see how it goes. So, but it was an adventure. What we, so we, what, with that one in particular, was that the main motivation? It was just the curiosity, the kind of adventurous uh, Well, at first, yeah, I was curious, uh, you know, because I'd never done, well, I did a book with my parents, but that, that neither of them played for Manchester United. Uh, <laughs> my mother was on the bench one night, but she never actually she never got onto the pitch. Uh, <laughs> um, but it was just well, this is going to be totally different. So I decided yes, I would be interested, and we met myself and Roy met here in Dublin, and uh, we got on. And then I told him what I had in mind, and he told me what he had in mind, and we thought, well, we give it a go, will we? You know, and um, you can't just say we we'll give it a go because then you have to sign contracts, and suddenly we have no choice but to give it a go. And an amazing experience, really amazing. And uh, um, other things, I, I, I was invited to do several plays that I wouldn't have, it wouldn't have occurred. My first play, uh, these men who ran a theatre company called The Passion Machine here in Dublin asked me, would I write a play? Because they'd read the commitments and they thought, well, maybe he, he can do something on sta for stage. Mm. But I'd never have done it myself, you know. But these two men who I respected and really liked asked me to do it. And that's why I did it. So um, I'm open to these sort of ideas. Uh, just, just launching, I can't tell you what it's about, but just launching into a, another project, a book that I'd never, you know, if we were speaking six weeks ago, it wasn't in my head at all. Now it's all engrossing. Um, was this another one that was suggested from the- Suggested from to me from the outside, yeah. Hmm. Yeah, well, and I, I'm, I'm afraid I can't, it's not public knowledge yet, but- um, Fair Not enough. that it's a big secret, but I can't actually talk about it just yet. Are you allowed to say if it's another collaborative venture, or maybe maybe I should just stop? Uh, it, it, there's no point. You could it, it, twenty questions won't get you that much quicker. And I try to answer them honestly, but no, it, it's not why we're here tonight, really. No problem. No problem. <laughs>
Which um, is a polite way of telling you to back off and leave me alone. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> Rudy. Uh, here's a good question from Kuhn, Kuhn Welch. I hope I'm pronouncing the name correctly. You write about aging men uh, and, and the aging of men with, with great compassion. Charlie Savage and Jimmy Rabbit, for example. Uh, but um, my favorite character of yours is Paula Spencer, of course, uh, from two, two novels now, I think. Uh, would, two, yeah, yeah. So would you want to give her or another new female character a similar outing? Um, the answer is yes. Yeah, yeah definitely. Her um, one? She's one of the characters, you know. So, for example, Paddy Clark, ha, 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 the 10 year old boy who narrates that story. After I was finished that book, I thought I'd captured it. I thought I'd, I'd done as much as I could with it, but I've never had any curiosity, be, uh, curiosity about him as a character since, which sounds a bit brutal in some ways. Other characters tend to linger and I add the years to them and wonder how they're getting on. And that sometimes is as much as far as it goes. But Paula Spencer, particularly, I think perhaps because she was so difficult to achieve at the very beginning, you know, I was so far away from her in terms of my own life experience, in terms of the fact that she was a woman. Uh, I'd never witnessed domestic violence, let alone experienced it, you know. Um, so there was so much going on there that I didn't know about that it took a long time to get to know her. And once I got to know her, it went a little bit further than, you know, I'm always, I always say, it's all about words, you know, you know yourself, Rob, you, you know, the, the, the character doesn't exist without words. And sometimes you take away words and the character begins to disappear. You put in too many words and the character becomes bloated somehow. Mm. And it's the same with Paula. And then I really enjoyed writing the second book and following her in a year of her life, which tallied in some ways with my own life. She was a road sweep, not a road sweeper, as I I'd worked some time ago as a road sweeper when I was a student and she's cleaning houses and she gets a pain in her hand. And I did as well. I couldn't open doors for a while. I couldn't do anything with my left hand and I'm left handed. And it was very, you know, I don't know. It was worrying, to put it mildly. But at least I knew I could continue what I was doing for a living. So I gave her my pain, so to speak. But with her, it was literally money at the end of the week or no money because she cleaned houses for a living. If she couldn't clean the houses, she wasn't going to be paid. Therefore, she was going to be destitute. So I was able to use that short-lived experience of my own because it didn't last more than a month and give it to her. And that gave it the urgency because actually I was close up to her experience in that way. So I will be going back, you know, barring accidents, uh, I will be going back to Paula Spencer, yeah, because I think I've been adding the years to her life and wondering about her children. And now she also has grandchildren and maybe even great grandchildren at this stage, even though she'd still be relatively young. But um, I really liked her as a, as she, you know, the book, the last one came, the book came out in 2006, I think, but it was set in 2004. And I liked the way she looked at how Ireland and Dublin was changing mm. that there was nothing mean-spirited or avaricious. or There was no envy. She was curious about what was happening, curious about the fact that when she went into the local supermarket, it was an African woman behind the till now and not one of the women from around the corner. And she was working increasingly with African men and African women. And while she felt a bit isolated, she didn't feel any way hostile, mm. you know. And uh, so and her children, I think, are are kind of impressive people. If you, if you met them, I think I'd be, if they were real, I think I'd be impressed by them, the way they have um, uh, carried themselves through life so far. So yeah, I definitely, you know, uh, can I say definitely? I don't think I can ever, we can ever say definitely really. You know, but but it, I, it would be my intention to go back to Paul Spencer. Sounds yeah. like a firm, fairly firm intention, the way, yeah. the way you're talking about it. Uh, yeah, it is. Yeah, so uh, I think people will be, will be pleased and excited to hear that. Uh, the next question is from Udo Lauterborn from the German Irish Society in Dusseldorf. And it's a simple one. Roddy, what do you read yourself? Uh, who, who are your favorite writers? Charles Dickens is my favorite writer. I mean, I've been asked the question quite a few times and I always go for Dickens because he has been a, a favorite writer of mine all my life, really, since I was a child. And I go back to books 
And I'm sometimes I re, I recently tried to re, reread Catch Twenty Two, which I read when I was a teenager and thought was the best thing I'd ever read. And I tried to read it maybe four years ago, and I couldn't get past the first few pages. I just I still happy to submit that it's a brilliant book, but I'm not sure if it's a brilliant book to the head of a man of my age. Yeah. It just seemed tiresome, you know. Yeah. But I can well imagine if it's one of the first books you ever read. How, how extraordinary it is. But with Dickens, I deliberately didn't read a few of Dickens's novels so I could read them later on, you know? And I read The Old Curiosity Shop earlier this year and I thought it was extraordinary, really, really extraordinary. So Dickens is my favorite writer. Um, Hopeless with Carried Names. I think the most impressive book I've read in the last six months or so would be a book called um, Breasts and Eggs by a Japanese woman. And at the moment, I can't think of her name. I feel really good. I know the book you're talking about. I, I can't think of her name either. It's an amazing book. Is it? Brilliant. And there's another Japanese woman, and I can remember her name because her first name is Yoko. So <laughs> mm -hmm. That's an easy one to remember. Yoko Ogawa has a novel called The Memory Police, which I think came out in Japan about 30 years ago, but it is amazing. And another one called... Uh, the Housekeeper and the Professor, which I finished reading a few days ago. And that, to me, is a form of storytelling that I wasn't familiar with before. But brilliant. Really, really brilliant. So they're the books that are um, have been engrossing me, really. Um, I'm trying what, to think. What, I'm reading what, a book of short stories set in the world of boxing by a writer called FX Tool. I read it 20 years ago. He wrote the, the story, The Million Dollar Baby, that the movie... Yeah, was based on brilliant writer, really raw, very very good. He's dead, yeah. unfortunately. Yeah. Um, what 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 has triggered the uh, in seeming interest in uh, Japanese fiction? Is it just a phase, or have you always liked what they're up to? Or I've all, I always dip into the odd Japanese book because it, it is so far away, you know. Um, but also I'm uh, a little project with a Japanese writer we're, we're pen pals in the because you know travel is so difficult this this was I was asked would I be a kind of would I write three letters to a Japanese writer and she'd write three to me so she wrote to me I wrote to her so while I read she has had one novel published it's called um, oh uh, there's no such thing as an easy job and again uh, Kukoko, and I can't remember her surname. And it, it, I'll remember it the minute we stop. You know that, you're right? Yeah, of course. But, yeah, there's yeah. no such thing as an easy job. And it's a brilliant book, very funny. And, and, uh, and a picture of Japan that I wasn't expecting, uh, maybe because she's a much younger woman or whatever. But she wrote to me and I started reading, I read her book and then started reading other books by Japanese women, just whimsical in a way, just to, in, in, you know, surround myself in a way. And, and actually it's been a great um it's not even a it's like a bit like a holiday in some ways i suppose you get away from the usual structure yeah and the usual things and it, uh you know sometimes when you read three four irish books in a row you feel you're you've been in the kitchen for months do you know <laughs> and it's good to get out of the kitchen and i think the japanese writers are doing that for me yeah yeah and a lot more of them from what i can see just when i wander into bookshops are being translated into yeah. them, you know, like the contemporary ones and like yeah. female young female authors. a lot of them are women yeah which is great and i don't mean that in any tokenistic way i think it's genuinely great the same in ireland because from the male perspective you know you know a 63 year old man having grown up in a certain type of country. And then I read a book by a 30-year-old woman who's grown up in the same country, but it's an entirely different country. And the perspective is very different. Walking down the street for a man is a different experience for a woman. So it makes better, it makes, in a way, surprising reading in a way. And I always love, I love being surprised, you know, and I love to, you know, so it's, um, I go out of my way to try and get away from myself, so to speak, when I'm reading. Yeah, good. Um, uh, just another uh, question here from Maddie Dodd. Uh, when it comes to characters, do they have to be likable or at least relatable? Bit of a classic question here, con constantly debated in a sense. No, I don't think they have to be likable. No. Okay. Uh, 
relatable. Yeah. I'm not sure what that means, but it, 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 does that mean it's kind of believable? Um, or that there are, there are points of similarity in the lives? Yeah, I think that's more, isn't it? Like that. Well, that's, that's, if you like, that gets down. That's down to words as well, isn't it, Rob? It's the, the right words and little. You know, sometimes something simple like naming a television series that happens to be in the air. Like when I was a teacher, I was aware that the American, so at least the Australian soap Neighbours, was huge because kids were coming back from lunch late because they were watching Neighbours, and. I was able to include Neighbours, I think there's a reference to Neighbours in the Commitments or the Snapper, without ever having seen it myself, you know? I didn't need, I didn't feel the burning need to watch the thing, I just knew it was there. Yeah. <laughs> and I think that makes it more relatable somehow in a way. So it was easier to do, do you, do you know, 40 years ago, there was going to be one song that was going to be heard everywhere at any one time no matter what shop you passed by or went into and turned on the radio, there'd be one song. That doesn't occur anymore now. So it's harder to find these little points of, uh, these little points that are shared by everybody. Yeah, it's fragmented now. And yeah. that's, made that's it the better. challenge, that's fine, you know, that's the challenge. That's why in a way, um, writing from the perspective in love, writing back to the men in the eighties, you know, when they love talking heads, you know, and, and actually, because of the way young people listen to music now, they're familiar with talking heads. They don't consider it to be old music. Mm -hmm. Far from. They yeah. they don't seem to judge music in that way anymore. Because I think they're probably not reacting to their parents in the same way that I would have been reacting to mine. Mm -hmm. My dad saying, "Turn down that bloody noise." And, then, and when I hear him saying, "Turn down that bloody noise," I knew I was listening to music. <laughs> it had passed the test because my father hated it. <laughs> yeah. And now, you know, if I, when my kids were younger, they'd be playing something, and I, I'd ask, "What's that?" And it's, so instead of saying "turn that off" or whatever, they'd say, "You know," I'd ask, "What's that?" And I think mm -hmm. so. That, do, you, do you like what they listen to? Do you share it? Do you? I don't know what they listen to now because they're not. But I, I, in a lot of cases, I do. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, because of, uh, although. And there's a point now, and one I wrote a short story recently. There's a reference to Taylor Swift, the lyric from Taylor Swift. And I know she's huge, I know she exists, but I know nothing about her music. But I just was able to, you know, home in on her as an example of what a bunch of young women were listening to. Yeah, yeah. Respectfully, you know. Yeah, of course, yeah. But it's just not, it's not, I won't be doing the homework to familiarize myself with the music because I don't think it's meant for me. Yeah, yeah. She has some bangers, though. She's a. Uh, she's no, <laughs> um, good. Uh, another question, Roddy. We just have about five more minutes, so maybe just yeah. one or two more. Um, you, uh, Joseph Dominguez uh, asks, you've already spoken about the idea for this book and how it came to be, um, actually through, through grief and as you explained. Um, but how has it been with your other works? Um, you know, obviously they all haven't come from the same source, so uh, have they come to you in a different way or is it completely mm. different each time? I think it's a different experience each time. I need something to start with. Not a big idea. I mean, two men meeting in a pub isn't a big idea or two men meeting in a restaurant. I need something to start me off, gradually get to know them, begin to see them. And I don't necessarily feel the need to describe them, even though I begin to... It's more not so much see them as to, yeah, in a way I feel that I'm at the table as well as they talk and I'm listening, you know, and that gets me going. The novel before that, it, it's a novel called Smile. And again, it's about memory and a trauma. And I was interested in um, the whole idea that sometimes we, not we, but, Awful experiences can sometimes be so repressed that they're obliterated, that they're forgotten. Mm -hmm. And um, so I knew, in a sense, that's what I wanted to try and achieve before I knew the character. So I wasn't, I wasn't starting with the character. I was starting with what I wanted the character to experience, in a way, before I got to know the character. 
which was a, a difficult, it was difficult to get going, difficult to find my way into the story. Um, but that's what I was up to there. Another book, it's about uh, Jimmy Rabbit as a man in his 40s, the manager of the commitments, and he's contracted bowel cancer. And the impetus for that came from the fact that in a very short space of time, I discovered that three friends of mine had bowel cancer. Good. Yeah. And I thought, well, it's a phase of, phase of life. They're roughly all the same age. All three survived, luckily, and are still alive. Um, but I, so that's what I thought there, you know, this is, um, they're at, they, I was at, and they're at that stage where uh, mortality isn't something you discuss in an abstract way anymore because your friends are dropping off like flies. So I was trying to capture that. I was trying in a way to write a funny book about death. You know? Yeah. Um, yeah. So it, it's different. Each book is different, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah, great. Just one more, uh, Roddy. I think we, we can squeeze you in if that's okay. Yeah, sure. Valerie O'Connor asks, now this is kind of more about the, the publishing world and actually how it's changed in many years, but you, you've said that self-publishing the commitments, uh, there was almost immediate interest in, being in, in it being made into a film. And from what you said, you, you, you had your pick of directors and stuff. How did you get your book seen? Um, if it wasn't promoted by a publisher, uh, what, what did you do to get it out there? It seems like, I don't know, in some ways a much simpler time. Uh, very little fiction being published in Ireland at the time. So I sent, I wrote a kind of a, a, an outrageously tongue-in-cheek, arrogant press release to go with the thing and um, made up fictional blurbs by inappropriate, like uh, Reginald Bozen, he used to read the news on ITV. I gave him a blurb in the thing and we had great fun doing it and sent it to all the reviewers and it ended up being reviewed in the Irish Times. I didn't know anybody in the Irish Times, yeah. but I think because of, um, I think that because they didn't get much in from you know, from Ireland, it usually came via London, that it got a bit of attention. And then it got a very hostile review in Hot Press, the music magazine. Did it? Really, really hostile. Surprising. Which actually was great. Yeah, I would have thought at one level, yeah, surprising. I think they felt they, it, somebody they didn't know was encroaching on the property that they, they owned, music, yeah. you know. But anyway, Elvis Costello was living in Ireland at the time, and he was writing an article for Hot Press about the early, his early days of um, uh, before he formed the attractions and became Elvis Costello and the attractions. And he said, if you want to, in the article, he said, if you want to know what it was like at the early days, read the commitments. Really? Yeah. I, and that sparked a bit of a, a rep, it got a reputation because yeah. on one level it was being dismissed by hot press. And at the other side, it was being pointed to by Elvis Costello. Wow. And to my mind, who are you going to listen to? <laughs> yeah, that, that, so, that I never knew. That's uh, yeah. That's, that's so it became that word cult. You know, it became a bit of a cult. cult uh, piece. And we gave away free copies. We, you know, when the printing presses are running, it, it doesn't cost that much to, you know, print another thousand. It, the expense is getting them running in the first place, and um, so it printed way more than we were ever going to sell. So uh, the Passion Machine, the the plays were. The play, say, that I wrote was on in uh, the SFX Centre, which is now gone, but it was a great gig venue as well. So mm -hmm. the association with rock, the Clash, the Pretenders, the Smiths, I saw them all in the SFX Centre. So we started giving out free copies of the commitments to people who went because we thought this was the audience we want. You know, it was some off Gardner Street, you know, it wasn't mm -hmm. in any rarefied place. And uh, so a lot of people still have that copy of that book. I've been told more than once that I have that book at home. So um it generated i think it generated a reputation quite quickly which was really part of the fun mm. um, uh, it all sounds very punk it sounds like you're yeah. talking about the, the early days of the sex pistols or something yeah. like that. this kind of guerrilla marketing and yeah. uh, flagrant right. we made it up you know even uh, i went to the local bank where i had my bank account the one nearest the school i used to teach in looking for a bank loan to do the thing it wasn't outrageously expensive. It was about the same as I'd needed for a second-hand car, you know? 
didn't want a second-hand car, but because I wanted to publish a book, uh, if I'd wanted a second-hand car, and I had a full-time permanent job, remember, you know, a teacher. Yeah. Uh, if I'd wanted the car, they'd have given me the loan there and then. But because I wanted to publish a book, they wanted a business plan. So myself and my friend, John Sutton, who basically published the book together, we, we made up a business plan. And it was utter bullshit. It was a bigger piece of fiction than the book itself. But we went, to, I brought it in and gave it to the bank and we had a meeting. And I remember when they, did, when they gave us the money, and I mean, I suppose for about half an hour, I forgot that I'd have to be, I'd have to pay it back. You know? <laughs> but it did feel, I, we did feel a little bit like Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid coming out of the bank <laughs> and crossing the road back into town to get the bus back into town. Yeah. And we were laughing, you know, laughing that um, if the business plan had been accepted because we knew nothing about publishing, nothing whatsoever. Yeah. But again, the money was mine. I, I was well able to pay it back, you know, on a monthly installments. But it just felt, again, this is great crack. <laughs> you know, yeah. just <laughs> shrewd, shrewd move on the uh, the bankers. Um, uh, a good, good move on the bankers' part as well. You know, that's that's they. they oh, they were. You, you know that phrase, back and brave. They were back. <laughs> they were back and brave. You know, <laughs> but they got their money back with the interest, so I wouldn't say. Um, yeah, yeah, it was funny. Great. Um, well, Roddy, it's been a great pleasure to talk to you uh, about love, uh, your novel, you, and, and other things. Yeah, thank, thank you. Thank you, everybody, actually, who organised it. It's been a huge. Uh, I've enjoyed it enormously. Yeah, yeah, and thanks everybody. I'm sorry to those whose questions. I'm kind of having uh, questions fielded at me from various angles here, so I'm very sorry to those I didn't get a chance to ask Roddy. Um, but um, well, Rod thanks. has agreed to write back to all of you, isn't that right, Rod? <laughs> yeah, I, I will. Um, but I'm going to hand it back over to Candice Gordon now. And um, good night, everybody. Thanks again. Thank you, Rob. And thank you, Roddy. Uh, it's such a pleasure to listen to you talk and to hear the reading from Love. Um, it would be great, of course, if you can come over to Berlin next time and that. we can have you at the embassy. Love that. Um, so, yeah, this brings us to the end of the event. Um, and, oh, by the way, there was a message there from Anna and also from Dave Gordon from Curious Fox, just to say that the author of Breasts and Eggs is Miko Kawakami. Yeah. So, um, so I want to thank you again, Rob Doyle and Roddy Doyle, for such a great chat. Um, and thank you all for attending, those who came and uh, attended in the Zoom room, um, and also those who are watching on Facebook and on YouTube. Um, thanks for all the great questions. Um, and I also just want to take a moment to thank the Consulate General in Frankfurt and the event partners, Curious Fox Berlin, Varia Vardar and the Munich Readery. Um, of course, they will be stocking uh, Roddy and Rob's books. Um, so, you know, you, when you're interested, you can pick them up there. Um, I also want to thank Shakespeare and Sons in Berlin for helping to promote the event. So I'd like to thank my colleagues, Ilias, Milena, Thomas and Niall for their help with the event tonight. So if you would like to keep up with the embassy's cultural events and uh, all of the events at the embassy, you can sign up to our cultural newsletter and to the Monats book by emailing culture.berlin at dfa.ie. I think it's uh, scrolling at the bottom of the screen there. Um, and of course, do follow us on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram at IRLEMB Berlin. Thank you all. Have a good night. Are we allowed to talk?